In this video, I'm going to briefly talk you through an annotated bibliography entry for your profile essay. Note that there are two slightly different types of annotated bibliography that you could make. One of them is descriptive, which is the type that we're going to be doing today. So this is for an essay that doesn't have a specific clear thesis statement or argument. Instead, you're trying to present a lot of information or assemble a lot of information. If you'd like to learn more about how to write an annotated bibliography for a research paper with a strong thesis, you can look up my other annotated bibliography video, which is on my personal YouTube account, as opposed to the Southeastern Louisiana University account. In addition, it's important to note if for some reason you're not watching this as a student in my class, that this is tailored particularly for the profile essay that my students will be writing for me, particularly with respect to the fifth criteria that you'll see on the list to the left, I've given my students a particular set of requirements that they need to meet for their research for this essay. And if you're not writing this for me, your instructor probably won't be asking you to describe which of the research criteria it meets. On the right, you can see that I have accessed an article called Polly Perrette, 25 Things You Don't Know About Me, which is by Rachel Paula Abrahamson and three other staff writers at US Weekly. This is a just a list of 25 facts about Polly Perrette, all written in first person, which leads me to assume that Polly Perrette has actually been involved in the compilation of this list. I've done other research and I know that it's fairly reliable because many of these things I've heard her say in other interviews, but this is a good list to put them all together. In my annotated bibliography, I'm going to start with a formal work cited entry, which in this case I've pre-written, and then I'll work through each of the separate idea items in my list on the left. In the first place, you'll always want to start your annotated bibliography with a correct works cited entry for your source. Here you can see that I've gone ahead, I'm actually trying to match colors on the left, but the after after this entry the first two words of each section are also going to be bolded so if you happen to be colorblind you'll at least be able to see where each section begins and ends and just quickly this is in times new roman size 12 i can set those up here it's double spaced which I can set on the paragraph menu in Microsoft Word. I have double spacing, zero spacing before or after, and a hanging indent of half an inch from the left margin. So the first line of this entry is going to stick out to the left. And in an annotated bibliography, we're going to do something that's going to feel very odd to you, but we're going to begin each entry with that hanging indent and run the whole thing together like a paragraph so that it's very, very easy to see when each separate item in my annotated bibliography begins and ends. I don't want to be confused by having multiple paragraph breaks within a single entry. So left align, hanging indent, double spacing, no space before and after, Times New Roman, size 12. All of these are things you'll want to check and maintain throughout. This will also help you in your works cited page when you submit your essay later because you'll already have all of this formatted impeccably. So the first thing I want to start with is a summary of the main points the article or source offers. This is really going to vary a lot depending on the source that you've chosen. In this case, I have 25 very disparate facts in a really kind of random order. And so I took the time as I was preparing this to read over these pretty slowly and to think about how I could assemble them, particularly with respect to my eventual project. I wanted to group sort of her early life things together and her later life things as well as other professional skills. I have lots of other NCIS sources, so I didn't do very much that referred to NCIS sources. So my first item is just a general description. This article lists 25 facts about Polly Perrette, some of which are related to her life. Others are, of course, related to things like NCIS. And I've started with the earliest fact I found that she was born in New Orleans and that she lived in a lot of states during her childhood. And this is a direct quote. She lived in Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. 
I'm going to finish this and every single other item in my summary with a parenthetical citation. And the reason I want to do this is because if I've reworded things enough and I've been attentive enough, then later when it comes time to write my essay, I'll be able to come back to my annotated bibliography and find some of these sentences. And I may not be able to use them verbatim, but if I do borrow some of these or adapt some of these for my essay, I'll always have the citation right there in the sentence, which will save me a lot of time later on trying to figure out which source a particular item is from. So that's just a tip to hopefully make your life a little easier. She watched very little television in her childhood. I know this because she says that she grew up in a southern church and saw almost no movies or TV as a kid. You'll also notice that if I don't put things in quotation marks, I'm trying to be very attentive to put them in my own words. So that's something else. If you do use a direct quotation, even if it's small and feels kind of factual, like this Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, anytime you've borrowed the writer's exact words, I would recommend putting them in quotation marks, even in your annotated bibliography. It feels ridiculous, but it will really help you later on when it comes time to cite things in your essay. I also have her early jobs, restaurant jobs, waiting tables, job in a car lot. I had to work pretty hard on this sentence to make a new list. This is a item number five. She says, I started working in a car lot at 15. Then I was a cook, a waitress, a bartender. I wore a sandwich board and roller skated around, passing out flyers. So I've kept the in a car lot, but I've also tried to use different language for the jobs. She worked in the kitchen behind the bar, waiting tables. She worked in a car lot, my direct quotation, and then she distributed flyers for Taco Bell. Again, a lot of this is thinking about how I can integrate and organize and compress this information so that it will be useful in my biographical sketch. This is really a pre-research organizational structure before you get to the writing of your essay. I talk a little bit about her college. She studied sociology, criminology, and psychology. Again, she's used those exact words. I don't want to rephrase major names, so I'm going to quote that directly. And at the very end of her, at the very end of my summary, I want to talk about some of the things she's done more broadly in her career because I think that we don't need to just talk about what she's done on NCAS. So I found throughout this, she talks about her music videos in number five. She talks about her singer, Somebody Saved You is her song, and she talks about her series of Volkswagen ads. So I've found those different skills that are sort of related to her performing work, and I've given them their own cited sentence in my work cited as well. So right now I've got a correct work cited entry in MLA format, a summary of some of the main points that the article offers. This could be a shorter summary if I had found less useful information in this article. So don't feel like yours has to specifically be five or six sentences long. Yours should be as long as it takes to sort of preview the essential information from that source that you'll want to use in your own paper eventually. This is sort of a cheat sheet that you can use to go back to your original sources. Then I want to think about why this source is reliable, how I know it is peer reviewed, maybe a little bit about the author and quite possibly a little bit about the publication. So first I'll describe my newspaper. US Weekly is a national publication released weekly that offers stories about numerous celebrities. That's its sort of basic. I know that just from going into the, the grocery store and seeing it on the newspaper stands. As I know from seeing it on the newspaper stands, some of its articles and headlines seem a little bit like clickbait. So then I thought, is this actually a reliable source at all? And I Googled it and I found this wonderful Gawker article by Maureen O'Connor called, Which Tabloids Lie the Most? And she ranks them all. And you'll see that US Weekly has the highest accuracy, according to O'Connor, and this is actually 2010, so I don't know if it's changed in the last 10 years. But you'll see that US Weekly has a 59% overall accuracy, which isn't really great. But then I kept reading on, and O'Connor notes that 
this high percentage is partly derived quote, from its tendency to rely on paid for exclusives about reality stars and C-listers, sort of reliable, sturdy actors and actresses and other celebrities. And so I think Polly Perrette is probably a little bit above a C-list celebrity. I think that's a bit unfair to, to Polly Perrette. But I do see that this reads much more like an interview, and those interviews are actually what's pulling this magazine up to its high status. So I think I can rely on the interview of Perrette in this instance. I also might want to know a little bit more about the author and a great quality of ProQuest is I can actually click on my author. So I've clicked on Rachel Abrahamson and you can see that she's written over 3,000 articles and they often tend to be, here's the return of an R&B superstar, another return, some I'm not so sure about Carrie's hot body secret, but I have a number of stories that look, and I don't need to read all 3,000 of them, but I have a number of stories that look like she's doing some basic reporting work, that she's asking people about their ex experiences. I do also have some that seem like clickbait, but she has written 3,000 articles, one for this top one for the New York Times and a number of other ones, a lot of other ones for the US Weekly. So I'm going to assume she's a fairly experienced journalist and give her some credit for that. And I've concluded, therefore, although I would not necessarily trust a shocking revelation published on the front page of US Weekly, again, because my gawker points out that these sort of sturdy narrative biography interviews are what makes the magazine more credible. I think I can trust these more credible facts that seem to be taken directly from Polly Perrette in this instance. I've completed my summary with its citations. I've completed my explanation of why the source is reliable. It is not peer reviewed, so I haven't addressed that. One thing I want to think about now is how I could use this in my essay. And hopefully I've been thinking about that as I've been reading the article. So this shouldn't really take me very long to write. In my biographical sketch, I've said I'll use my, some of the facts about her childhood education to enrich my account of her early life. That's probably going to be a section in my biographical sketch. And I'll also reference her early jobs and singing career in a section describing her broad life experiences to complement her television work and her other famous material. So that's just where am I going to put this? And I've already thought about that as I've organized my facts in the first half of my annotated bibliography. Then this is special just for me, so for all of you who aren't in my class, you don't probably have to do this, but since I've asked my students in particular to identify five different types of sources, I want to know which, which source type you think this is. In particular, in this class, I've asked students to find two sources from databases. This source is one of two that I've found in databases, so it counts as a database source. I just have a single sentence. If you're not sure how you're going to use your source, if this happened to be peer-reviewed, you could say, this is peer-reviewed, and it's also a source found in a database if you're still trying to figure out how you want to place your articles in your annotated bibliography. So let's sum up very quickly. I've used this article on ProQuest as a source for my biographical sketch, my profile essay. In my summary that I've provided in my annotated bibliography, I have a single double-spaced paragraph with a hanging indent of half an inch that's left aligned, and I've included a full works cited entry in MLA format, six sentences summarizing the main points that the article offers that benefit my eventual profile. A brief, actually mine is not very brief, but an explanation of why I think this source is reliable. I don't actually think it's peer reviewed. A brief description of how I plan to use it, what sections I'm going to put it in in my essay. And at the very end, a description of the criterion it meets with respect to the assignment that I'm responding to. You'll also notice in black that I've added accurate citations for all the quoted and paraphrased material. And again, the reason I want to do this is because that will help me when it comes time to write my eventual essay, because I won't have to go back and find and insert those parenthetical citations. As I write my essay, I can just focus on assembling my materials and my facts in the smoothest way possible.
If you're in my class, there will be a version of these two documents posted on the course page if you want to consult them and look at the color coding. If you have color blindness, look for the bold letters at the beginning of each section so that you can distinguish where each color coded section goes after the citation. Each set of bold letters will indicate the beginning of the next point on my list of items that you're that your text should include, except for citations, which are interspersed throughout. If you're writing this for me, you don't need to bold things because I am not actually colorblind. You can color code if you would like, if that will make your annotated bibliography easier, but you're also welcome just to make the whole thing go as smoothly as possible and to put it all in black at the very end. I should easily be able to tell your sections just from the content that you've provided. Have fun writing your annotated bibliographies. Good luck, and if you're my student, please feel free to email me if you have any questions.